So hello again. Um, I'm sorry we keep on cutting the uh, coffee breaks short, but despite the good intentions of uh, allowing only a few sessions, they seem to be too interesting to be able to make it within the scheduled time. Uh, we now have a very interesting um, presentation on uh, securitization and the capital markets. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Nick Kurmi from Ganado Associates Capital Markets. He knows the subject very well and I'm sure we are going to learn quite a bit uh, in this field. I think Dr. Nick needs no introduction. He's well known both locally and overseas. Nick. Hi. Um, like John said, I'm uh, Nick Kurmi from Canada Advocates Capital Markets Team. I'll save you the lengthy biography and uh, just jump straight into the subject. Thanks for being here on the final day of uh, the conference to listen to all of us speak. Um, so I'll be talking about um, mainly securitization, what it is and what its application can be for, for ship owners and shipping companies. So it's nice to see some optimism around the room. I mean, most of the shipping conferences I attend are always about doom and gloom and the, the need for, for capital. Um, but you know, the last panel was very optimistic. Um, and I'd like to sort of follow in that, uh, in that vein. So the, the, the fundamental problem remains. Uh, shipping companies need capital and uh, how do they get this capital traditionally? They get it from the bank or they get it from the capital markets through equity or corporate bonds. I mean, let's put equity aside for the time being. And I think our last panel um, went into that in, in quite a bit of detail. But uh, let's say generally it's, it's bank lending and, and corporate bonds. Now I'm here to talk about securitization which are asset-backed securities they are an alternative to, to corporate bonds. There, there's still a, a debt obligation, uh, a promise to pay or an IOU from the, from, from the company, but they're slightly different in that these debt obligations are backed by particular assets. So. Let's figure this out. Sorry about that. Okay. So, um, asset-backed securitization. Um, securitization is a bit of a dirty word. I mean, ever since the financial crisis. But it's the financial crisis itself which gives us a very good example of both why securitization is a useful financing tool and also the ways that it should not be implied or the ways it can be misused. There's a very interesting book by Michael Lewis called The Big Short. I think there was actually a film out recently. And if you'd like a good insight into the financial crisis, that's something to, to look at. But in a nutshell, you know, this was securitization back in 2008 and 2009 of uh, bank loans. And what the idea was, was for banks to um, get loans off their balance sheet to securitize them, to transfer them to an SPV and turn them into securities for the capital markets. Now, that is good because it's creating capacity for the banks to lend more money into the economy. The problem there was, in a nutshell, um, the, the wrong incentives, greed and basically mis-selling. No, no investor really knew what they were buying and this is why a lot of investment banks are today paying um, a great deal of, of fines to the, to the SEC in the US. Now, as I said, it's, uh, securitization is about creating capacity, but I think it's, it's important to go through a quick diagram for, of a typical securitization structure to understand, uh, for those of you who are not perhaps so, so well versed in the subject, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so, moving from left to right, you have a, an SPV which is uh, set up. That SPV issues instruments to investors in the capital markets. These investors pay cash, 
to the vehicle, and the vehicle then uses that cash to buy assets from the originator, the company that needs the funding. So the funding, um, the funding is coming from the capital markets. Now, what happens then is those investors are repaid from the cash flows of the assets that are transferred to the vehicle. So that's that box in, in green over there. Um, you, are, you are creating capacity for these originators, for these companies, by selling future receivables generally, and you're, you're turning them into cash right here and now to, to satisfy your immediate funding needs. Now, the, the key here, as opposed to a corporate bond, which I was mentioning earlier, is, is the fact that you're removing these assets from the risk of the, the company, the company originator. Um, when you have a corporate bond, the investor is exposed to the whole risk of the company. Yes, the company has more assets, but it also has more liabilities. So it's, depending on the company, uh, a riskier investment. Now, for an asset-backed securities deal or a securitization, you have a, an asset which is placed into an SPV as the sole asset of that SPV for the benefit of the investors. You are removing it from the bankruptcy or insolvency risk of the originator. So an investor doesn't have to be worried that this company is going to go bust and not repay these bonds. All he has to worry about is the risk, the risk of the asset and the asset not performing or not paying the, the cash flows. Now, this all links to bankruptcy remoteness, so this is the typical structure. Now, what we have uh, in Malta, which is, is based on best practice abroad, uh, including in our legislation, are structures where everything is designed around this bankruptcy remoteness feature. So, the originator or the shipping company group, for example, won't own the SPV, the SPV will be owned, it will be orphaned by a, a purpose trust, for example, or in Malta, it's a purpose foundation. It's an entity that is set up solely to hold the shares in the vehicle. It has no beneficiaries, it has no owners. So that is a, that is a key way of removing the insolvency risk of the originator, because if the originator doesn't own the SPV and the originator had to go bankrupt, uh, if, if it doesn't own it, it can't get sucked into its uh, insolvency proceedings. Uh, and another interesting feature is the fact that our law, um, which was rather a long time ago in 2006, but has only recently been applied, and this is because of the, the financial crisis issues which I was mentioning earlier, um, specifically states that the SPV is bankruptcy remote from the insolvency of the originator. Now, it sounds obvious, and uh, the way this has been done traditionally is to create these separate structures where once the asset is outside the patrimony of the originator, this shouldn't happen anyway. But you'll find some clever lawyer somewhere who will try and say that, no, no, that asset should have remained with the, with the shipping company and shouldn't have been transferred out. So to have that specifically stated in our law is, um, is a very, very important thing for, for investors. And the whole law is basically designed for, for the, the, the priority of investors. Now, I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't talk a tiny bit about the law, but in a nutshell, Malta securitization regime um, is based on the Securitization Act, which outlines certain principles um, which address the specific legal challenges that the market has faced um, in the past years and basically codifying um, certainty. Securitization cell companies regulations, which provide for a, uh, a, a multiple issuance structure where you can undertake multiple securitization vehicles through the same legal entity. So while there's robust segregation, it also provides a more cost-efficient way of setting up these uh, individual transactions, because you don't need a separate company for each one. And there's obviously the tax. Um, our securitization deductions rules specifically state that you can achieve tax neutrality in the, in the vehicle. Um, and this is because of a special uh, residual income deduction, which allows you to wipe off any remaining chargeable income or profit in the vehicle um, at the end of the taxable year. And again, this is, this is great, but it's, it's in keeping with market practice also in other jurisdictions where SPVs are also, also tax neutral. Um, I also mentioned the European uh, legislation and recently there's been a push to regulate things at a, at a European wide level. 
more than they have done in the past. And I'm speaking about the Capital Markets Union, and there's a, a draft regulation currently um, being circulated, which is about simple, transparent, and standardized securitization. Now, this, this is meant to, to be the, for the, the protection of investors who are investing in these products, um, and it's meant to revitalize the securitization market. The only problem is, uh, as tends to be the case with a lot of regulation, it's a, it's a, at least those in private industry are seeing it as, as a form of over-regulation. So it might even end up uh, stifling the market. Just to touch on some of the points I mentioned earlier, and these are the, the key benefits of our Securitization Act locally. We've got the statutory bankruptcy remoteness um, that I mentioned, and also true sale and assignment. True sale deals with the actual transfer of the asset to the vehicle, and uh, basically the law says that won't be recharacterized re in any way. Um, recognition of, of limited recourse and non-petition provisions, and the exclusive right to petition for bankruptcy. Now, these are, are very important for investors in these types of transactions because um, you're basically giving the sole right to the investors to wind up the vehicle if they need to, but no one else can actually um, um, petition for the bankruptcy. You know, this is standard in securitization deals in the contracts, but what we have here is the additional protection in the law, which basically confirms what is done already by contract. Um, there's a, an automatic first ranking privilege on the assets transferred to the vehicle, again in favor of the investors. Um, uh, exemption from licensing, you know, this is not a fund, this is not a financial institution. The purpose here is to, to create uh, solid structures, but um, in, in an efficient manner. There's a tax neutrality and you have the SECs, which um, I've talked about. Now, something worth mentioning here is the fact that uh, as most of you know in the room, this is, this is what shipping companies do, shipping organizations in Malta, for example. Um, they have a dedicated SPV regime, even if it's not called that. They are special purpose vehicles which are set up to put ships in there. And uh, the various rules surrounding shipping in Malta and shipping organizations are there to protect the primary lender, the primary creditor of the, of the shipping organization which is typically the banks. Now what we have in the Securitization Act is similar creditor-friendly concepts, but obviously applied on a much broader um, spectrum. So how does this relate to shipping, as I'm sure you're all wondering? Um, uh, shipping uh, uh, companies need capital, right? Um, um, so what securitization can offer here is an alternative to traditional ship finance and reduce this over-reliance on the bank uh, lending, which our earlier panel was, was discussing. Um, and it's not just reducing uh, the reliance, it's also about the fact that it's drying up whether shipping companies like it or not. So, okay, we have corporate bonds, but now we have uh, asset-backed securitization. Now, how does it how does it work? You know, um, how can shipping companies take advantage of this? Um, shipping companies can use this structure either to raise finance or even um, refinance existing bank debt. And um, even a little goes a long way in the current uh, cycle. You know, it might just be the difference between saving a shipping company from failing them, uh, from failing and, and, and pulling through. But the important thing to mention at the outset is the fact that this type of structure only works with cash producing assets. So either cash flows themselves, receivables, and we'll talk, we, I spoke about that in terms of the uh, bank loans that are typically securitized, securitized uh, credit card receivables, auto loans, that sort of thing. Unless you have a cash flow, it, it doesn't work. Because what you're doing here is you're turning that asset into a security. And in order to pay back the, the security together with the return, you need a cash flow. It also works with certain assets like ships, which um, although not naturally, they are not receivables, they can create a cash flow in the form of charter party payments. And this is important because this might not work for every shipping company. It might be more useful for, let's say, the larger shipping companies or, or the ones with uh, a more diverse fleet. Uh, who could perhaps use um, newer vessels, vessels like container ships, 
which uh, are currently riding the wave a bit better than certain other um, shipping classes. Uh, and they can use this type of structure to um, increase funding now, which just might help the whole group and, and get them through the cycle. So uh, I'd just like to uh, go through this example here. This is an, a, a very simplified example of a transaction we've worked on recently. Um, which actually won Marine Money's uh, Structured Finance Deal of the Year Award. This was for United Arab Shipping Company, um, which, uh, as you all know, is a rather large shipping company based in the, the Middle East. And what UASC did is it refinanced very expensive existing bank debt on um, several new bills, um, these uh, ultra-large container vessels that it had purchased in 2012. Now, it did this through, the, through this uh, securitization structure. So it privately placed debt. We're talking about listing debt and, and equity early. This was a private placement of asset-backed securities to US institutional investors and also some European investors. The cash came into the SPV. Um, the SPV used that money to purchase these container vessels from uh, UASC and to then subsequently lease them back to UASC, thus creating the cash flow receivable in the form of the charter party. Now those charter party receivables, which um, are going to um, be coming into the SPV over the lifetime of the transaction, are going to be used to pay the, the return on the, on the notes to investors. Now, what was very unique about this deal, because there have been um, securitizations done in the, the shipping sector before, but what was unique about this one was that this replicated the structure of uh, the WETC framework in aviation, which is used very heavily and is, has been very successful over the past, let's say, 10, 15 years. And no one had ever decided to apply it to, to uh, shipping. Now, it doesn't get into all of the details here, but um, that's certainly a point to keep in mind. The other um, unique feature was that this, these SPVs were set up as shipping organizations under our shipping rules, but also as securitization companies under the Securitization Act. Um, somehow this worked, and the Register of Companies accepted it, but the fact that we were able to um, avail ourselves and of the mortgagee-friendly and lender-friendly provisions of the shipping rules and also from the creditor-friendly provisions of the Securitization Act um, made this deal, let's say, unique to Malta and uh, possibly the best place to do this uh, kind of transaction. Um, just to touch upon um, securitization generally from the investor perspective and securitization of, of this particular asset class, uh, I'd just like to say that this is a, a, a non-correlated uh, asset class, generally speaking, because it doesn't move with the financial markets. Obviously, that depends on the, the sector of the ship, but um, it, it will continue to produce, typically, even though the financial markets might, be, might, be going, um, might not be doing so well. And investors would be interested in this kind of product because it would typically offer uh, a higher yield or, or return on investment. Um, I won't bore you with the remaining uh, details, and I know I'm, I'm uh, running out of time. Um, I'd also like to touch upon something which was raised by uh, Mr. Dallas uh, earlier. So he mentioned that the rating agencies don't have a particular model for this structure at the moment. Maybe Moody's had tried, but didn't work out too well. And this is what really distinguishes between the shipping sector and the aviation sector here. Um, the rating agencies have very well-established models for aircraft securitizations, very much like this. We're just talking about aircraft leasebacks and not ship leasebacks. And because of that, you know, the rating agencies know how to model these deals and will assign better ratings to, to the securities issued, which is always important from an investor perspective. Now, we had rating agencies here, and they gave, um, in our opinion, very decent ratings, but they could have been much better. And this was the problem here, that the, the rating agencies perhaps didn't... Uh, uh, distinguish um, the shipping industry as a whole, which you know is not looked upon very favorably by the rating agencies um, at the moment, from the let's say very innovative and unique features of this uh, transaction. We feel if they did and they took the time to come up with the with a new model, 
um, for for shipping securitization that uh, these uh, these structures would be uh, let's say much more popular. But certainly in the current climate, um, we feel that securitization, if done correctly, and if there's a solid structure available there to protect the the investors in these products. Uh, can provide a very uh, viable form of alternative finance uh, to shipping companies. And that's just a little example of the cell company I was uh, talking about earlier, where you can have one, one uh, uh, structure with multiple patrimonies for, for each uh, transaction. Well, that's it. Any questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for a very enlightening presentation. I'm sure there are a number of us in the room who are not fully aware of the advantages of securitization. Could I now ask uh, the next panel to take the stage? We're now going to be talking about, actually, we're going to learn, most of us are going to learn what the Cape Town Convention is, and uh, it's going to be ably moderated by Dr. Anne Fenech, who, well, together with the other lawyers, need no introduction, but I leave the introduction of the panelist to Anne, but Anne is very well known in her sector, and I thank you very, very much, and also for understanding the, sh the shortage of time. Please take the stage. Thank you very much. So good morning, or I should say good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are fully aware of the fact that the only thing that stands between you in this room and lunch is us. So we are going to make this as uh, quick and as informative as possible. Um, Cape Town Convention. John said, you know, we are here to learn about Cape Town Convention. Well, I think it would be fair to say that we are here to share views about the Cape Town Convention because the truth of the matter is that as far as the Cape Town Convention and shipping are concerned, uh, there are really and truly very few people who know or who are aware of um, what and how the Cape Town Convention can or should interact with shipping, and that is precisely what we are here to explore this morning for the next hour or so. Um, what we're going to do is this. Daniel Aquilina, and I will just now uh, briefly introduce you to Daniel, who, as John said, really needs no introduction, but for those of you who are unaware of who we are, Daniel is a partner heading Ganado Advocates Banking, Ship Finance and Aviation Teams. Um, he has assisted leading international banks and financial institutions involved in the financing of Maltese registered vessels and aircraft by perfecting the registration of mortgages and ship interests. Daniel has considerable experience in the drafting of Maltese law regulated um, security and has been involved in complex multi-vessel and aircraft transactions, including advice relating to alternative ship finance mechanisms and structures under Maltese law. But more importantly, I've known Daniel for years. He's a great guy and sits with us on the Malta Maritime Law Association Committee. So Daniel is going to speak about the Cape Town Convention to put us all in the picture. What is this Cape Town Convention? I will then follow on and talk to you how Cape Town Convention sits with shipping and where we are there. And then Nick, and I'll tell them all about you, Nick, when you stand up and do your bit, will be taking it from a practical aspect. So between us, we hope to cover and give you an hour's worth of thoughts about the subject. Daniel. In your hands. Thank you, Anne. Can I ask that the presentation? Thank you. Okay, so the Cape Town Convention, what's this all about? Um, so the Cape Town Convention is particularly uh, popular with academics, I must say, and it's also very well known in the aviation industry. Uh, as you will see as I go along. The Cape Town uh, Convention and the Aircraft Protocol uh, were concluded in 2001. Uh, that was in Cape Town, hence the name. 
under the auspices of uh, UNIDRA and ICAO. Uh, UNIDRA is the International Institute for Unification of Private Law. Its main function is to foster modernization and harmonization of private commercial law. ICAO, of course, is the International Civil Aviation Organization. So, the Cape Town Convention is actually uh, a standalone convention to a certain extent because it is more of an umbrella convention. It has been described as one of the most ambitious and successful conventions uh, to have ever um, uh, been drafted, and that is by Sir Roy Good, who wrote the official commentary on the Cape Town Convention. To, that is basically the Bible of the Cape Town Convention, and I recommend it to anybody who wants to understand more. There are three existing protocols right now. Uh, only one is in force, that's the aircraft objects, the Cape Town 2001. It's been in force since 2006. The other two protocols are not yet in force. It's the railway rolling stock, uh, drawn up in Luxembourg in 2007, and the one dealing with space assets, 2012 Berlin, also not yet in force. Are there other specific, sector-specific protocols being discussed um, and possibly being created? Yes, and of course that's why we're discussing this at the Maritime Summit today. There's the ships protocol, which uh, we will deal with as we go along. There is the MAC protocol, which deals with uh, equipment which is uh, linked with agricultural, construction and mining. And there's also um, talk and debate on renewable energy equipment protocol. So what led to the Cape Town Convention? Basically, because of the very nature of the assets involved, we're talking about aircraft, space assets and, and uh, railway, uh, which regularly cross borders, that creates sometimes conflict of law issues and of course creates challenges for lenders um, who sometimes were faced with instability of their rights and interests over the assets themselves. Uh, it must also be said that not all states have the adequate legal framework to protect creditors in case of default by the debtors or uh, adopt otherwise restricted approaches when it comes to uh, possessory rights. Uh, there are also issues with recognition and priority of mortgages over these assets issue of competing liens, of course, recharacterization of leases sometimes, and also, unfortunately, we have all come across it at one stage or another, uncooperative courts in particular jurisdictions, as well as the risk of insolvency. So the vision behind the creation of the Cape Town Convention was to create a sound, internationally adopted legal regime for security, tighter retention, and leasing interests. That will, in turn, encourage the provision of finance and leasing and also reduce the costs, as we shall see. It also offers greater security and stability and certainty to creditors and lessors, thus lowering the risk of loss and enhance the credit rating of the loan. So, in brief, the, co the key objectives of the Cape Town Convention are to facilitate the efficient acquisition and financing of mobile equipment, to date, it is the equipment we've mentioned in the existing protocols. It's also to assist in the development of cost-effective modes of transport and space assets. Of course, the more these assets are more easily financed, the more the areas can grow and develop, uh, thus promoting also more research and, and development in, in these assets. It brings about significant economic benefits to countries or players in those countries that previously did not have those kind of opportunities for financing. More importantly, it provides the creditor with default and insolvency-related rights and remedies, which are very clear under the Cape Town Convention. The Cape Town Convention also established an electronic international registry for the registration of international interests. I must say, it is not a registry which is a tighter registry. You don't register the actual aircraft or engines themselves in this international registry. It is only the security interests over those assets which are registered. Um, so the Cape Town carrying on also creates clarity on ranking of competing interests and give, gives greater confidence in decision to grant credit and the ability to enforce rights. There's also what we know in aviation as the aircraft sector understanding, which has been uh, amended from time to time, the most recent titling being in 2015. And this applies to financing by export credit agencies. Uh, what happens here is that export credit agencies that are happy with three main criteria. One, that the uh, operator is based in a country that actually ratified Cape Town. 
two, that they made the necessary qualifying declarations, and three, that it properly implemented the treaty, then those export credit agencies are applying a 10% uh, discount, let's call it, on the minimum premium rate. So these, this is what is known as the Cape Town discounts. Uh, an export credit agency, I'm sure most of you in the room know, is a private or quasi-governmental institution acting as an intermediary between the government and exporters to issue export financing. And the financing can, of course, take different forms, uh, such as credits or credit insurance and guarantees. Uh, the next slide shows a few examples of uh, export credit agencies. One of the most active in aviation is probably also because uh, the United States market is very strong when it comes to aviation, is the, is the Exim Bank in particular. So when does Cape Town apply? The sphere of application of Cape Town, um, there must be a security agreement basically, which is constituted according to the formalities of the Cape Town, which relates to equipment, this high value mobile equipment we've been talking about. The equipment must be defined in the relevant protocol, so if we had to speak about the protocol that is in force, we are talking about aircraft, engines, and helicopters. Uh, the object must be uniquely identifiable, so every aircraft has a manufacturer serial number which is unique, uh, and also engines have their own identifiable unique serial numbers. So if we later go into debate on shipping, you know, the identifiable, uniquely identifiable factor will probably be the IMO number. Um, also, it's important that the debt is situated in a contracting state at the time of the conclusion of the agreement. When these are in place, then Cape Town applies. So there are three forms, principal forms of financing for aircraft. You forgive me if I'm talking about aircraft more than ships at a maritime summit, but of course there are the parallels we need to understand. The first one is the one we are more traditionally accustomed to, which is the loan secured by a security interest in the object. The second is a sale under an agreement which is conditional, so you have a conditional sale or title reservation agreement, and therefore the seller would reserve its ownership until he's paid in full. And the last one is much more um, widespread in aviation than shipping, at least to date, which is the leasing, financing lease um, with or without a purchase option. All these forms of financing of aircraft require a legal regime to enforce the contractual and proprietary rights and secure the priority against other claimants. And the Cape Town Convention is doing that. So the creditors' remedies are generally quite akin to the more creditor-friendly jurisdictions also in shipping. Uh, one is taking possession of or control of the asset itself, selling or leasing the asset, actually collecting income or profits from the, even the lease of the asset itself, and obtaining preliminary relief pending final determination. Insolvency has also, uh, there's also a big say in the Cape Town Convention. There are three options, that's actually not a mistake, but Alternative A is the more creditor-friendly approach, whereby the creditor has a clear right of taking possession of the asset following a waiting period if the default subsists. This is usually found more in common law states or those states that are approaching the more creditor-friendly approach. The more conservative, debtor-friendly approach, Alternative B, means that the creditor needs to apply um, to the court for approval before taking possession of the asset. But every state that ratifies the Cape Town Convention has to make state declarations and has to make the, its choice at the time of ratification. The third option relates to, the ter to an ad hoc uh, alternative which is only in the railway protocol, so in order not to confuse things, I have omitted it here. This is just a screenshot of Aviareto's website. Basically, the, inter the registry, unlike the traditional registers and open registers we're accustomed to in shipping, is actually an online register. Again, you don't register the actual aircraft or title in the aircraft or engines, but you register security interests over those objects. This is an online register. Um, it is currently with Aviareto, of course. Their contract may expire in a few years' time. Aviareto is based in Dublin, but the system is totally online. So here you have a 24-7 electronic and automated registry. Um, you have electronic registration and searches. It works with a drop-down menu 
and you register your security interests actually online. Of course, you need to have authorization from debtor and creditor to be able to do so, and it, there are, of course, the IT uh, protections there have to be. Uh, priority is de determined, of course, on a first-to-file basis, which is pretty much what we have in our traditional mortgaging system of uh, date and time to determine priority. Now, what we're seeing in aviation, because Malta is also a party to the Cape Town Convention and the Aircraft Protocol, um, is that banks are taking a double cover. They're taking the local mortgage, but also taking the international interests, at least so far. Um, and uh, the important thing is that the international interest for the Cape Town Convention to work well must proceed over national law. So in case of conflict, the Cape Town Conf Convention takes priority. Just briefly, um, and this is to stem some debate later about CMI's role in particular, this all started because an industry group uh, requested, uh, was requested by Unidra. Uh, Airbus and Boeing were the main sponsors behind it, but also engine manufacturers who thought that they needed better protection in terms of security interests over their engines. In aviation, engines are particularly high value and not necessarily, almost hardly ever, in the same ownership of the aircraft, of the airframe. So manufacturers, finances, and lessors uh, came together to create the Aviation Working Group. They regularly review policies and the way that states are implementing the Cape Town Convention. They also created a legal advisory panel made up of experts that uh, analyzes anything which needs to, imp to be improved and um, makes sure that the Cape Town Convention is in constant evolution and development and, and is solving the problems that come across. They've also created a practitioner's guide, which is very helpful, as well as a model implementing law, which makes it easier for states who want to make Cape Town part of their law um, uh, reality. So finally, the AWG, and we'll open the debate now for CMI and its role, is um, involved in the implementation, adoption, enforcement of the CTC and the protocol, and its constant um, overview and, uh, and improvement. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, bridge the distance between what we've heard, what is the Cape Town Convention, um, and, and shipping. So why are we here at the Malta Maritime Summit discussing the Cape Town Convention, which, as um, Daniel very um, uh, well explained very well indeed, is really a convention which talks about the registration of security interests in mobile assets. That is the basis, that is the convention, and then it's only as a result of attached protocols to the convention that the convention applies to different sectors. So we heard um, Daniel talking about, um, uh, naturally, its application to aircraft. Um, and we also have it applying, I think, to rolling stock, isn't that right? Um, and space assets. So where does shipping come into the equation? Should the Cape Town Convention also have a protocol which makes it apply to shipping? And that is the question. When in 1996 the convention was first drafted, ladies and gentlemen, as Daniel said, this was an initiative of UNIDRA. And when it was first drafted, a reference to shipping was in fact included in the original draft in square brackets. Um, uh, what happened was that when a number of other organizations, such as UNCTAD, IMO, the International Maritime Organization, and CMI, the Comité Maritime International, saw the reference to shipping in square brackets, they said, hang on a minute, what's going on here? Why have they included shipping in the Cape Town Convention? Which, as also Daniel explained, was really um, designed very much with the aviation sector in mind. Because the aviation sector, I suppose, required, needed, felt the need for there to be some form of unified force when it comes to the registration of security interests in 
aircraft because there wasn't one. That is really the truth of the matter. So when CMI, UNCTAD, IMO, saw this reference to shipping in square brackets, they said, wait a minute, do we really need this? Why, are, why is UNIDRA even talking about extending the Cape Town Convention to shipping? And the main issues then were shipping is as old as the hills. Shipping has a history. Shipping is regulated by international maritime conventions already. There are intergovernmental, private industry-driven initiatives which always deal with problems or issues that arise in the maritime sector, mortgages and the registration of security interests being one of them. It was also a time when the 1993 Liens and Mortgages Convention had just been formulated. I will remind you that the Liens and Mortgages Convention was a convention, is a convention, that really talks about the strength of security interest, mortgages against vessels, how they place one against the other, how a mortgage ranks with regard to other types of liens. So, generally speaking, the shipping community said, this is not appropriate, certainly not at the moment. We do not need the Cape Town Convention to be extended to shipping. Um, so, the shipping in square brackets was removed, Cape Town Convention takes place, and there is no reference to shipping. And UNCTAD, CMI, and IMO, at that moment in time, breathe a sigh of relief. And life goes on. Um, is the situation with regard to the registration of mortgages perfect? Possibly no. Are banks 100% happy with the scenario? Possibly no. But, and a very quick but, the regime which governs the registration of mortgages and the international regime which governs the um, protection of creditors is fairly satisfactory. Because what we need to remember in shipping, ladies and gentlemen, is that quite apart from the need to protect the financiers, the mortgagees, shipping attracts, because of its very nature, a whole other group of creditors. We have ship repairers. We have crew. We have the providers of provisions. All of these, by and large, in most jurisdictions around the world, we have ship agents here in the room, ship agents. All of these creditors are protected by most laws all over the world when it comes to defaulting ship owners, when it comes to bankrupt ship owners. So there is a very real concern out there that we cannot possibly only regulate and take care of the financiers, but there is a whole load of other group of creditors out there that need protection. So in any event, to cut a long story short, I, the Cape Town Convention did not extend to shipping. However, um, uh, what happened in 2013, which is now quite a way down, down the line, um, uh, it came to the notice of CMI, the Comité Maritime Internationale, that UNIDRA had decided to put it back on its agenda, although in a very low priority manner. I understand that the manner in which um, priority issues are decided, or rather the way issues are decided at UNIDRA in terms of them coming up for discussion, they rank them in order of priority. And the shipping discussion on whether or not there should be a shipping protocol was given a low priority on the agenda. However, the fact that it was put on the agenda at all in, 19, in 2013 came up, um, attracted the attention of the CMI, the Comité Inter Maritime Internationale. Now, I'm sure all of you in this room know who and what is the Comité Maritime Internationale, but for those who don't, the Comité Maritime Internationale is an, uh, an association which was created in the late 1800s and is really responsible for the drafting of most of the international maritime conventions. It has observer status at the IMO 
and um, I am actually on the executive um, board of CMI now. I've been there for the last couple of years, and therefore Malta and CMI have now got closer together. So the president of the CMI wrote to the Secretary General of UNIDRA and said, look, we note that uh, this is back on the agenda. Um, what's going on? And the Secretary General said, well, really nothing much at the moment. We are just putting it on the agenda because we want to start understanding how financial security interests are dealt with in various jurisdictions when it comes to shipping so that we can assess the situation. And who better than CMI is positioned to do this homework because the membership of CMI, ladies and gentlemen, are not individual people. The membership of CMI are the individual maritime law associations all over the world. So what Mr. Stuart Hetherington, the president of CMI, decided to do was um, to initiate an international working group within CMI to figure out what are the finance security practices all over the world. Um, I was asked to chair this international working group, and the next task then was to make sure we had the right people on board. And we have a great team of people, and these include, and I need to tell you who they are so that there is an appreciation of the type of persons who are in charge of this group. We have David Osborne, who is a partner at Watson, Farley and Williams, who is the rapporteur. We have Andrew Tetley, um, who is a partner at Reed Smith in Paris. We have Armstrong Chen, who is a partner at King and Wood Mallisons in Beijing. We have Professor Sushiro Kozuka, who is Professor of Law at Kagushwin University in Tokyo. We have Camila Mendes Viana Cardozo from Mendes Viana Cardozo in Brazil. We have Alan Black from Winston and Strawn in Washington. Stefan Reintfleisch from Elemann Reintfleisch Gado in Hamburg, and Andrea Berlingeri from Studio Legale Berlingeri in Genova. And there you will see a cross-section, an international group of people very, very heavily involved in this industry so that they can really drive this ahead. So where are we with this international working group? Well, where we are is that we have drafted a very extensive questionnaire. This questionnaire runs into five pages, six pages, which would normally really um, scare most people. But the point is this, and I would like you to take this back with you should you know people involved in your maritime law um, organizations. The reason why it is an extensive questionnaire is because we really want to find out what are the finance security practices in your various jurisdictions. Because some of us might think, well, you know, going on the adage, what ain't broke, don't fix it. If the system works, then why are we going to go out of our way to create a regime which is still has loads of question marks and issues? On the other hand, if there are issues which need to be resolved, if there are problems, then we need to do, know about them. And we can only do this once we have a really good questionnaire. And the questionnaire, for instance, goes into things like this what maritime conventions has your jurisdiction signed up to, what is the nature of the ship's register in your jurisdiction, uh, what are the formalities associated with mortgage registration, information relating to security interest in ships, can you arrest a vessel, can you arrest a chartered vessel, what is the order of priority between the mortgages and the other um, uh, liens, how do you enforce mortgages, how do you deal with judicial decisions and appeals? What is the sale procedure? Is there a form of enforced sale? Is there a form of a court-approved private sale? Is it an efficient system? How long does it take? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Can a mortgagee, as envisaged by Cape Town, take possession and sell? Can a mortgagee immediately proceed with a judicial sale? Can a mortgagee immediately proceed with a court-approved sale? It's only when we come down to the nitty-gritty and find out what is prevalent in these jurisdictions that as CMI we will be able to say not appropriate for there to be a protocol or appropriate there should be a protocol. So that is, ladies and gentlemen, where we are as far as CMI is concerned. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, over the last year, there has been an interest. There are three very good pub, uh, articles which I would recommend for reading. They are, one is by John Bradley, 
uh, from Weda Price, who wrote about Cape Town and shipping and said, you know, what are we talking about here? Is this a solution or is it a solution in search of a problem? Ole Boger, on the other hand, um, presented a very learned piece at the, recently at the Oxford Cape Town Academic Conference in Oxford and made a case for the protocol on shipping. Vincent Power, on the other hand, a partner at AL Goodbody, assesses the legal and economic case for a shipping protocol. So I'm going to stop here. Nick, I hand over to you now to take us through some practicalities. And um, by way of introduction, Nick is a transport lawyer based in Malta and particular, with a particular focus on asset management and finance issues. Nicholas has also considerable experience in vessel and aircraft ownership and operational structures. He also coordinates vessel and aircraft reposition procedures on behalf of international credit instruments. So, Nick, over to you. So, that's all from me for, for the time being. Thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you, John, for having us here. And it's a great initiative, and we hope to see more of this in the, in the future, too. So thank you. Thanks a lot. So my presentation is going to be about the practical impl implications of adopting um, a shipping protocol for the Cape Town Convention. Um, So if I, first start, I would like to first start with a description which is quite obvious, and Anne hinted at that. But in reality, when we're speaking of a ship, we speak of, of an asset with particular historical ca characteristics. For example, legally, a ship is considered to be an asset which is not part of the patrimony of its owner. So we always say that the ship constitutes a different patrimony uh, from that of its owner. Why am I getting into this slight detail? I'm just going to... I'm sure everybody is aware of this, but I just want to hint at this because it's important to remember historically where the ship as an asset has actually sort of developed over time. So a ship has particular rights in REM. This is all tied to the issue of personality and the notion of a separate patrimony. It can be subject to the registration of a mortgage or otherwise the notion of a high hypothec, which is a form of real security which actually encumbers the asset itself. There could be maritime liens, which are actually registered, not registered, which are actually um, arising against the particular ship. And over time, we've also seen the specific force say regimes develop in different jurisdictions. So historically, we're speaking of a regime when it actually comes to ships, which has developed over time. And if we speak about the first commercial ships we did international trading, so we speak about 230 years ago, the first steamships and coal-powered ships, these ships were all subject to this form of real security through specific instruments which actually came from notions of security over removable property. So when we're dealing with a ship, and we're going to discuss shipping in the context of the Cape Town Convention, I think it's, it's our duty to actually see everything within a historical context. Because if we don't do that, we're actually doing an injustice to those who preceded us and the whole corpus iuris, which has been developed over time. I mean, I just got, I stole this from my dad, but practically, this is a frame of, the, of a ship called MV Sestos, which was actually sold by judicial auction on the 8th May 1961 in Malta. Why am I actually sort of showing this picture? Because it's important to know that this is 1961, sorry, not 66. So this is a sale which happened in 1961 through the legal system which existed in Malta in 1961. Now, since 1961 and today, the Maltese jurisdiction has actually passed through a considerable um, implementation of new laws and regulations relating to this particular sector, which is pretty much the, the notion of the rights in the REM and the personality of the ship. And maritime mortgages and liens. So we've got a massive development since then till, till today. This similar development has happened over years in many other jurisdictions, in France, Italy, Australia, the UK, so Germany. So these are all jurisdictions and many other jurisdictions which have had significant development um, in practice. What has happened over the years is that in shipping, there has been a consistent practice which has been 
accepted by courts of major jurisdictions too, in the sense that there is a, a specific custom which has developed over time. So I think before actually delving into the difference between aviation and shipping and the practical implications, we need to keep these aspects in mind. And now this is where actually um, aviation actually comes in. Why? In shipping, we've had private interest and private investment being always present. Let's, let's take the 1800s, early 1800s, as being the time when commercial ships started steaming along and carrying, carrying goods by sea. At that particular point in time, there was a very significant influx of private investment and private ownership of those vessels. And that continued throughout the year. Commercial aviation really and truly started in 1945, exactly after the end of World War II. There were a few commercial aircrafts, which were principally built through Boeing then, in its military arm. But the aviation industry was purely geared to address military logistics. Post-1945, there was a trend in aviation, and because the big aviation companies needed to actually develop a product which could be used for transport, the first commercial carrier started developing, till 1955, when the Boeing 707 was actually created, and we had the first reliable mass transporter uh, mass jet transporter, which would, you, you, you could travel on without risking your life. So practically, this is where we are today. So since 1955, jet aviation has developed immensely in the carriage of goods, of cargo and passengers. But till the 1980s, the main investor in the aviation field, the main investor in the aviation field has been uh, the states of different, different, mem different states. They have been the main capital injector injectors into the aviation sector. So most airlines were actually owned by states till the late 80s. The other private entities which owned airlines were in reality at a massive economic advantage because they operated through certain monopolies. I'll just cite two names, TWA and Pan Am in America. The very moment the, Uni the United States government removed, removed the uh, monopoly for, P for TWA and Pan Am was the day that those companies just failed overnight. So in the late 80s, you started getting to a point where aviation started finding this difficulty in self-financing. Why? Because it was principally either backed by these, mon these large organizations which had a monopoly or otherwise were backed by state uh, funds. So throughout the 90s, the industry, Airbus and Boeing, started looking at how to actually finance this particular sector. And there were two options. One was the, the traditional lending and purchasing solution, which is typically in shipping secured by mortgage. The second option was the leasing option. And the leasing option is also very important. Why? Because the leasing option gave a large manufacturer or its leasing arm, the possibility of actually producing the aircraft and rather than selling it directly for a full amount of for, for its actual price, it would lease finance it to a third party uh, airline. So with that in mind, that is when the Cape Town Convention came in and when the aircraft pro protocol was specifically developed. So the aircraft protocol came at a time when there was nothing in that industry except for in different jurisdictions such as Malta, there was simply a clause in the Civil Aviation Act which said that the clauses in the Merchant Shipping Act relating to mortgages are automatically adopted to the Civil Aviation Act and to aircraft. It worked, but one must say that it was never really tested severely in Malta then. So the Cape Town Convention fills in a specific gap for financiers, which was actually needed. Now, let's see, let's discuss the actual implication, and I'll leave this to the floor later on to actually discuss it. But the actual implication of implementing the Cape Town Convention for, for shipping, at least with the shipping protocol, with a, ship, a specific shipping protocol, is slightly difficult. Why? Because of the corpus juris, which I have mentioned earlier on. We're speaking of decades of development of 
whether in domestic law or through international conventions, which have created a form of custom, which is also accepted internationally and between major jurisdictions. As Anne said, it's obvious that there are certain difficulties. There are difficulties in interpretation. But today, as things stand, and with the international community developing conventions, and I'll get to another point on this, I think we are at a point where the Cape Town Convention wouldn't really work, because it would, we risk having or at least in relation to the, sec the typical security by mortgage. It might not actually work for the simple reason that we actually risk obliterating decades of development and practice. In the case of the mortgage and the hypothecary, we might actually speaking, speak of obliterating centuries of development. So my view, and we have discussed this profusely, is that the actual introduction of the Cape Town Convention in the typical sort of security interest based on what I'd call the mortgage format on a security agreement might be a bit difficult to implement given the different permutations and developments that have happened over the past years. However, is it all doom and gloom, at least from my perspective, for the Cape Town Convention? I would say no, but to a limited extent, which is, which, which is intricately tied to the trends of the ship finance market today. But before saying this, I would like just, just like to say one note. Possibly, unlike aviation, the shipping market is not struggling to find finance because it does not have the instruments to secure the interests of creditor banks. So that, to me, and even some authors pronounce that, is a fallacy. Because in reality, the issue is sourcing the finance. The issue is not whether it is adequately secured. So I think today, with the different jurisdictions offering a very secure mortgage package, banks are typically secured by taking a mortgage and other, obviously, self-help measures which have been implemented. So I do not believe that the problem of securing finance is at any time linked to the fact that the Cape Town Convention is not adopted. However, we're seeing a trend of having private equity and, uh, and, and, for example, pension funds from the US actually being used to finance the shipping market today. That is also showing the difficulty that ship owners are finding today through source finance through the normal credit institution line. So we're seeing a lot of influx of this type of equity from the US. Why am I mentioning this point, though? As Nick mentioned before, bond and note financing through the US is becoming more common. But we're also seeing another trend in the change of ship financing over the past years, which is especially linked to yachts or otherwise special type of vessels, where we're having a type of equipment finance type of financing scenario. And with equipment finance, large international organizations who are actually the builders of special LNG carriers or otherwise uh, you know, power ships or vessels of this sort, might have the economic prowess and potential to actually lease or finance lease that asset rather than make an owner or an operator go through the hassle, open in verticals, of actually sourcing finance directly from a bank. So there is this trend of looking into leasing. Now, in reality, if one looks at the Cape Town Convention, Let's say one had to discard the mortgage security type of interest. However, there is a good possibility. Okay, there is a good possibility of adopting part of the or something similar to the Cape Town Convention or part of it in relation to the securitization of lease interests. So the lease interest between a lease financier and the lessee, who would be actually finance leasing that particular asset it might be worthwhile considering where that type of lease interest with the various self-help measures and uh, incentives of the Cape Town Convention. It would be worthwhile thinking of whether we could implement that limitedly. So that's my slight contribution on this in the context of what we have discussed now. So I'll leave it to... Thank, thank you, Nick. Well, that was a very short um, uh, three-quarter of an hour. Are, are we in your good books, John? How are we doing on time? 
Um, a very quick um, entree to the Cape Town Convention and Shipping. Um, thank you so much, Daniel and Nick. I'm sure you will agree with me that they have put forward, they have explained what the Cape Town Convention is, and they have put it in some context, um, which I think is very important. We have certainly not solved the problems. We have certainly not answered the questionnaire. But certainly we have given food for thought, I hope. John, um, thank you so much for um, asking us to participate. In, in the summit which you have organized um, very, very well indeed. Um, uh, many congratulations for this and I hope it will be the first of many. Thank you. Thank you very much and um, thank you for your very kind words. Thank you very much for a very enlightening um, uh, presentation. I think the three have now really given us something uh, to meditate on the, the, con uh, the convention, the pros, the cons. I think, honestly, in all fairness, I thought I knew, but I've learned a lot, a lot, lot more today, and I think that will help all of us, even in discussions, in normal discussions on our own. So I do really thank you. I thank you for the effort put in. And uh, with that, I'd like to um, uh, bring this... Uh, first Malta Maritime Summit, first Malta Maritime Week to a close. But before I do, I would like to thank, obviously, um, all the sponsors, particularly the Ministry of Transport and Transport Malta. I have to thank the international maritime media. I have to say we had seven overseas journalists physically present here reporting. My particular thanks go to Nigel Lowry, who is still here at the back reporting live on uh, Lloyd's List <laughs> for his contribution in the first session, which um, has really had set the scene for this conference. And Nigel uh, will be summing up the conference, will be preparing a paper which will then be given to the Prime Minister, as, uh, as we had said. Um, Nigel is a very, very seasoned uh, cor correspond uh, journalist. Lo he's the Lloyd's List correspondent in Greece. And this document, we know, is going to take a lot out of Nigel, or rather, he says it's going to take a lot out of him, but we know it won't because he's very good at it. So, Nigel, thank you very much, most sincerely, for that. I would also like to thank um, the speakers, the panelists. Again, I have to thank um, Minister Mitzi for his constant backing, the chairman, uh, um, at this time of the day, chairman of Transport Malta, James Piscopo, and a particular thanks goes to Ivan Zamut, who in the low moments was there to prod me on and uh, give that extra push needed when things were getting a little bit too tough. And finally, I thank you most sincerely, all of you, the delegates who are still here till this very day, after three and a half, that means three and a half days. And I invite you all to the Malta Maritime Summit 2018, which will be in the same place from the 1st to the 5th of October, 2018. Thank you very much. <laughs>